Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. We hope you enjoy listening to this podcast of St. Louis on the Air, brought to you by University College at Washington University. With undergraduate and graduate programs, part-time, evening, and online. University College at Washington University, offering world-class education within reach. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Illinois' new governor is spending his first full day in office following yesterday's swearing-in ceremony. J.B. Pritzker has big plans for his state, as outlined in his inaugural address. Joining me now for a closer look is Brian Mackey of Illinois Public Radio. Brian, thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, Don. Well, it was a very friendly reception the governor got yesterday. Not surprising, given the uh, audience was mostly Democrats. Democrats. He- Yeah, exactly. Anytime you have a change of power, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm. The same thing was true of Republicans four years ago, but uh, perhaps even more so now in Illinois, given that you have a Democratic governor who has both uh, the House and Senate have Democratic supermajorities for him to work with. So there is a a lot of optimism among Democrats that they're going to be able to get some of his agenda through. What struck you uh, in particular yesterday? Uh, a couple of things. He he did not shy away from some of the criticisms he leveled during the campaign, going uh, without naming him, uh, getting a little personal about Governor Rauner's governing style, which, of course, led Illinois to have a two-year budget impasse. Uh, but he also talked about the diversity that he wants to bring to state government. And more so than any other governor I've seen, he really plays has has consistently played up the role of his lieutenant governor, Juliana Stratton, who's the first uh, African-American woman to hold that role uh, in Illinois. And in fact, we now have uh, a majority of Illinois' cabinet are people of color. Uh, African Americans and Latinos. Uh, I, I should have said cabinet. That's the wrong word. Constitutional officers. So governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, uh, controller, treasurer, and secretary of state. Uh, two two white men, uh, three African Americans, and a, a Latina uh, controller. We'll pick up a little bit later on what he had to say about diversity because it, clearly he was passionate about it. Sure. But I want to go back to the uh, to the Rauner situation. Rauner was sitting in the first row, as I understand it, and uh, uh, during an early part of uh, Governor Pritzker's address, he went right after the former governor when talking about the budget. I won't balance the budget on the backs of the starving, the sick, and the suffering. And I won't hollow out the functions of government to achieve an ideological agenda. I won't, I won't make government the enemy and government employees the scapegoats. And that is uh, basically going right after Governor Rauner for what certainly Democrats and and eventually a fair number of Republicans saw as his strategy for getting his agenda through. The governor for more than two years said, we have to pass my turnaround agenda before I will talk to, you know, before we can really negotiate balancing the state budget, which at the time really required a tax increase. And that was ultimately what happened when more than a dozen Republicans, like I said, after two years of Illinois going through this partial government shutdown, uh, after two years of that, a number of Republicans broke with Governor Rauner and helped Democrats raise the income tax in Illinois and finally pass a budget. Well, is the new government going to be able to uh, balance the budget and keep it balanced? Uh, that's what he says. It's it's <laughs> rare that I would. You don't usually in a political speech hear a line like uh, "We're going to pass a balanced budget this year." Get get rousing applause, but it did, in fact, in this speech, and that's something that we used to take for granted in Illinois. But I guess uh, with both Illinois state government and now we're seeing the federal government, we certainly cannot take passing budgets for granted. Uh, he says he's going to do that. Uh, one of the things he wants to do is really overhaul the tax system in Illinois, implementing a, a graduated income tax, right, where higher levels of income are taxed at higher rates. But that is going to require changing the state constitution. That has to be approved by voters. So that really can't happen until the after the 2020 election. In the meantime, he has a lot of challenges. Illinois has a uh, just in the current budget year, 
uh, a deficit that the uh, out former Governor Rauner's budget office estimated to be $1.2 billion. It counted on doing things like selling the, the Thompson Center, where the big state government building takes up a city block in downtown Chicago. That has not happened yet. The legislation to authorize it hasn't even been signed into law yet. Uh, and there are other holes in the current budget. We also have a backlog of bills. If you do business with state government or you're in, uh, an employee waiting to get reimbursed for mileage or anything like that, it can take months and months for the state to catch up on paying its bills. So a lot of budget challenges that, that Governor Pritzker is going to have to deal with. But he does have that majority. Is he, is he going to be able to uh, really pretty much push the agenda he wants uh, without any considerable opposition? Yes and no. It depends on the issue. And I, I always say Illinois is a blue state, and it's, it seems like a blue state now. It certainly has been in presidential elections, and it has these large Democratic supermajorities. But one of the reasons is that Democrats have done a good job of being a big tent party in Illinois. You can be a, uh, a Democrat who is uh, favors restrictions on abortion. You can be a Democrat who is... Uh, does not favor gun control laws. And there are Democrats in downstate, central Illinois, very few in southern, uh, Ellen, really none anymore, in southern Illinois. That has been a, a, a going extinct. But, but because Democrats have this big ideological tent, they allow people to sort of diverge from the party line if it's what's right for their district, it's not always easy to get things through. That said, there are 74 Democrats in the House. That is the highest number since the 1960s. And in fact, it only takes 60 to pass something. So you have a lot of room to let people not vote for things they don't want, but still be able to get, get the legislation through. So like I said, that's, that's what's contributing to the air of optimism uh, among Democrats looking at this agenda. Some of the governor's comments uh, over the weekend certainly got a lot of attention uh, down in this part uh, of the state, if you will. He uh, promised uh, a lot of emphasis on economic development uh, down here. Uh, was that reinforced at all in his uh, his remarks yesterday? It, it was. He talked about downstate, you know, being forgotten. But then again, every governor really talks about being an economic development governor and going to bring jobs and bring back our economy. Um, you talk to economists, they say governors don't really have a whole lot to do with creating jobs. It's it's not as though they have uh, the massive power over the economy the way, even as much as the federal government does, and it's even debatable how much power presidents have over creating jobs, but that certainly is the rhetoric. Uh, Governor Pritzker has talked a lot about um, things like vocational training uh, and bringing back, which is something in in central and southern Illinois, there used to be a lot more manufacturing jobs. There used to be a lot more coal jobs. This is a, a part of the state that has seen a lot of economic uh, upheaval, displacement, if you will, been, been victimized by globalization and other forces that have uh, taken away those good blue collar working class jobs. And so to the extent that he is able to find the money, which is a challenge, but to the extent he's able to find the money to follow through on those pledges of improving vocational training and, and doing things like that, uh, then he may be able to, to to begin to turn that around. But, but he has, again, an uphill climb there. Well, if there's any community in the state that uh, is desirous and need of in need of economic development, it would be East St. Louis. And I know officials there are are going to be watching very, very closely. Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, and and this is something that 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 Governor Pritzker has has made a lot of promises. I, I went through his uh, last week for a, a story I did and, and sort of tried to to just create a, a check sheet of all the things that he promised during the campaign, both on. Uh, 19,000 words on his website's various policy position statements, as well as listen, you know, going back and listening through the debates and a number of speeches he gave. And, and he has made a lot of promises to a lot of different constituencies. A, a fair number of them cost money, and that is not something that Illinois government has in abundance right now. So uh, it, it's... Uh, I, I hate to fall back on that old public radio cliche of time will tell or we'll see what happens, but but that uh, that does really remain to be seen. Well, the diversity that uh, he is surrounded by and with uh, that we mentioned earlier in our discussion uh, may come into play, uh, particularly with regard to communities like East St. Louis. Let's revisit what he had to say about uh, his need for and desire for diversity. 
We will do all of this with the most diverse set of voices and perspectives that Illinois has ever seen. I have built a cabinet of people who will bring with them experiences that I don't share, from communities I did not come from, with expertise I don't have, because to lead well, all of Illinois must be represented in the decision making. And furthermore, I want all of the children of Illinois to see someone who looks like them in our government. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker. Uh, Brian, um, he's really quite a dynamic speaker, isn't he? Uh, yeah, he has definitely uh, has a c charisma that seems to, uh, I mean, I, you know, I don't know that he's quite up to President Obama levels of rhetoric, but but he certainly d was able to enthrall these Democrats. Uh, and, and I think more so than any Democratic governor, and I, I should add that I started covering the State House midway through the Blagojevich administration, so it hasn't exactly been a time of uh, great excitement about Illinois government, but uh, he does seem to have people excited about the, uh, the direction that he wants to go. And he is, he is, as I mentioned a little while ago, he is really um, playing up the role of his lieutenant governor, Juliana Stratton. And I think the way Democrats, at least in the, the crowd yesterday, re responded to her was notable. I can't remember the last time a lieutenant governor, uh, which is frankly typically a bit of an afterthought in terms of the state government, she seems to be a celebrity in Illinois Democratic circles in her own right. And she talked about in her speech, and with the DNA of my formerly enslaved great-great-grandfather William Stevens as part of my genetic makeup, she said she was proud to stand as Illinois' first black lieutenant governor. And that really seemed to, to get the crowd going. And uh, in fact, it was after her speech when people began slowly streaming out of the very long inaugural ceremony. But they, they waited to hear the lieutenant governor out, which is, which is a, a change from the past. And Brian Mackey, he has, a, has to have a lot of very happy staffers as well. I, I was really quite astonished to read last week that uh, he's using his own money to give significant uh, wage increases to uh, a great many people who will be working for him. Yeah, this is about 20 top aides just in the governor's office. Now, he's prohibited from doing this for anyone who has to be confirmed by the Senate, so not, say, the director of our Department of Corrections or Department of Transportation, but for people like his chief of staff, and he has deputy governors who are going to be overseeing certain areas of the state, as well as all the way down to his press secretary, he has created a an LLC, a limited liability company, that will basically double the state salary that these employees are given. Now, a number of people have said, well, this does raise some ethical concerns. They wondered if it's legal. There does seem to be an exception in the states. Typically, the state employee orientation says you should not accept outside money for the job that the state is paying you to do. But there is an exception in the Gift Ban Act that says you know, payments from another person in government are exempt. And so that's, that's how they're saying this is okay. He says the argument is that this allows him to bring in people who maybe otherwise couldn't afford to take these jobs. Uh, but one of the questions I asked him about is, you know, does this, and, and it's a danger I think is out there, you know, this is a, a man, this is the wealthiest politician in America right now. He's worth more than $3 billion. He uh, succeeded a man who was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And it, it certainly does raise the question, if the taxpayers can't afford to pay uh, Illinois public servants for the job they should be doing. You know, are we going to be reliant on getting billionaires or hundred millionaires to 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 run our governments because you, they have to supplement the salaries personally? Um, but but he says he's uh, emphasizing that you know he wants the people to be loyal to the state and not to him, even though he is as we said doubling their salaries out of his own pocket. I, I think it has to be unprecedented. Uh, well, there is. Uh, it's not quite a apples to apples, but Mayor Bloomberg in New York City, right before some of his uh, campaign workers joined the city uh, government, he gave them $100,000 bonuses. But there, the New York Charter apparently prohibited the employees from getting that extra pay while they were in government service. So I, I have not seen anyone find, and I have not, have not been able to find any other examples of people continuing in ongoing government service being paid both privately and um, for 
government work for effectively the same job. Uh, but there is that one Bloomberg example that, that his campaign pointed to. We'll have to introduce these guys to public radio. <laughs> we could use some of that cash. <laughs> one other thing, Brian, that uh, again caught my attention uh, yesterday was the amount of time that he spent on on climate change. That is not a typical issue you would find a governor talking about during an inaugural address, but but he certainly did. Let's listen to what he had to say. Now, our future depends upon our actions today, and that's why we must embrace a broad vision of environmental protection, or else decisions are going to be forced upon us in ways that will offer us little control and catastrophic outcomes for our children. I believe in science, and to that end, as one of my first acts as governor, as one of my first acts as governor, Illinois will become a member of the U.S. Climate Alliance, upholding the goals and ideals of the Paris Climate Accord. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, uh, that catch you by surprise by any chance, Brian? I, I, I guess I'm not too surprised. I mean, it, it's surprising to hear a governor you don't usually hear because that's considered uh, an international issue. Yeah. But, I mean, climate change is something we are seeing the effects of. Certainly, Illinois is, is a, a major agricultural state, and that is something people have an eye on. We had a, a, a huge number of tornadoes pass through Illinois about a month ago, which is r rather unusual weather for early winter. Uh, but you know, the, the, and I, I heard somebody, uh, a, what, what do we call it, a state house wag sort of joking that Illinois was going to join the Paris Climate Treaty. Obviously, that is, you cannot have a state joining an international treaty, but there is this group, as he mentioned, the U.S. Climate Alliance. It consists of uh, governors from uh, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Massachusetts, a number, uh, a number of other states that are trying to sort of live by what the Paris Climate Accords set forth. In, since the U.S. government uh, under President Trump is, has decided not to follow those precepts. And so to the, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen how much a state like Illinois can can really achieve in this realm, but, but uh, it'll be something to keep an eye on. And a coal-producing state at that. That's right. And, you know, but this is where these contradictions are in the promises. So, so Pritzker and his, one of his campaign promises was to support a, uh, a, a so-called clean coal energy research center at Southern Illinois University, while also promoting wind and solar development, two, two areas of the energy sector that, that some would say are at odds with each other. Just one other issue in the time that we have left. Uh, I know a lot of people are interested in this, and that's the issue of recreational marijuana. The governor is uh, right there, isn't he? He is. He has he campaigned actively on this issue, and uh, it, it seems to be something that's gathering steam. There are a number of legislators who are interested in this. Illinois passed uh, medical marijuana a few years ago, and but that was very slow to get off the ground, and it's a rather restrictive regime. This is not like some other states where you just you know go to a doctor, feel good, and get a prescription easily. You had to. It was set up at least to be a, a more challenging. Uh, to, to sort of keep people from easily just you know, abusing that system. But now it seems like uh, we're heading, if, if he can get this through the legislature, we're heading towards legalized and taxed uh, recreational marijuana in Illinois. Uh, just a couple little things to add to that. He has talked a lot about making it uh, economically inclusive, by which he means including um, minority-owned, women-owned businesses in this, maybe even having a percentage set aside. These would be highly, if, if it follows the medical marijuana model in Illinois, these would be highly regulated institutions uh, that would get these licenses. And then he has also talked about revisiting people who have past convictions for offenses that would now be legal. Now, there are very few people in state prison for marijuana offenses, but certainly in the jails. And he says, you know, if somebody went into the drug business dealing marijuana and it's now, you know, been decriminalized in Illinois, he is willing to look at using his powers of pardon and commutation to, to maybe undo some of those prisons. We've sentences. got to leave it right there, Brian Mackey. Uh, time is up. But uh, thank you so much for being with us and bringing us up to speed on the governor and his most uh, recent remarks in that inaugural address. Thank you. It was good to talk to you, Don. Same here. 
That's it for today. Tomorrow on St. Louis on the Air, we'll talk with a St. Louis man who has a unique perspective on the partial government shutdown as he attempts to visit every national park. We'll learn about Circus Harmony's production of Accelerando and hear from St. Louis comedian Greg Warren. Podcast episodes of St. Louis on the Air are available at stlpublicradio.org, or you can subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, the Google Podcast app, or elsewhere. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening. I'm Don Marsh. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.